Our speaker, Ilan Berman, is the vice president of the American Foreign Policy Council, a great organization with which some of you may be acquainted. <clears throat> I'm very well acquainted with it since I had the privilege of being Ilan's colleague on and off over the years when I've been a, a senior fellow there. And we're happy to have Herman Pershner, who is the president of longstanding of American Foreign Policy Council with us tonight, along with his lovely uh, wife, Liz. Now, Ilan is an expert in a number of uh, foreign policy and national security areas to include the Middle East, Central Asia, and certainly Russia. I think his first language was Ukrainian. <clears throat> And Russian. <laughs> Russian and Ukrainian? No, no, it was Russian. Okay. Well, he goes to Ukraine a lot, so I got confused on that one. Uh, he consults frequently for different parts of the government, uh, including the agency to, uh, with, with which some of you worked, and the Department of Defense. He is a frequent presence on Capitol Hill, where he is asked to testify. He's the author of a number of books, <clears throat> excuse me, Tehran Rising, Iran's Challenge to the United States, Winning the Long War, Retaking the Offensive Against Radical Islam. <clears throat> Two of the books which are for sale outside, which I'm sure Iran will be happy to sign for you after his talk, Implosion, The End of Russia and What It Means for America. Do you have any timing on that, the end of Russia? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, most recently, Iran's deadly ambition, the Islamic Republic's quest for global power. Ilan has edited a number of other books to which he's contributed. He's on <clears throat> the faculty at various places. He's a frequent presence in the Wall Street Journal op-ed pages and elsewhere. Without further ado, join me in welcoming Ilan Berman, who's speaking on Russia, Islamism, and the Middle East. Well, thanks very much, Bob. And so since you brought it up, I have to talk uh, about the title of my book, my 2013 book uh, on Russia called Implosion, The End of Russia and What It Means for America. I chalk that title up to an overzealous marketing department uh, because the real thrust of the book is how Russia is changing, uh, changing in terms of demographics, changing in terms of population, changing in terms of ideology, and that, that and my contention was that, that this may spell the end of Putin's Russia, eventually. That's a little bit of a different thing, but uh, as we know, certain marketers are not known for nuance, and therefore, what you have is what you get. But I promise you, it holds up mostly, I think, um, in the reading. So um, this is lovely. I, last time I was here was a couple of years ago. Um, when I regaled you all about the, the dangers of the Iranian nuclear deal uh, and how it's going to empower a resurgence of Iranian influence throughout the greater Middle East. I am delighted to see that I was totally wrong, that the deal was the greatest thing that, we, that the Obama administration has accomplished. We have nothing to worry about. Um, but it does sort of give you a little bit of a sense uh, sort of of the area that I tread intellectually. I sort of, uh, I work Historically, uh, thanks to Herman and sort of the freedom I have at the American Foreign Policy Council, I have uh, the ability to work in three areas. I work on Russia, where I'm a native Russian speaker and I've uh, spent uh, a fair amount of time. Uh, I work on uh, the Middle East sort of broadly in Iran, and I work on radical Islam and sort of transnational Islamism. Um, these used to be separate items. These are now all one big item right, in the sort of the Syria rock space. So it actually makes my job both easier and much, much harder. So um, Bob and I talked a couple of months back about uh, me sort of returning and coming to do a talk uh, here at Westminster. And uh, the, the thing that I, I think really caught his fancy was this idea of how what's happening within Russia itself uh, is having uh, a profound impact on the way Russia sees the world, why Russia wants to be involved in the Middle East, uh, a lot of it is what you would expect. It's uh, sort of imperialism and, and this sort of this expansionist impulse, but a lot of it is driven by things that most Americans don't see, this uh, sort of ongoing demographic transformation, the rise of a 
uh, radicalizing Muslim underclass uh, in Russia. All of these have a profound impact on sort of how Russia sees the Middle East and how, um, how Russia is likely to behave in places like Syria with countries like Iran and sort of how that's gonna, how that's gonna shape things. So without further ado, let me, let me start by talking about uh, codes and ciphers. Because uh, I know some of you worked on codes and ciphers in, in a past life. I, I would say that uh, the most important code and cipher that we had during the Cold War was something known as the Long Telegram. In 1946, George Kennan, who was then a senior official at the US Embassy in Moscow, wrote a, uh, a cable back to George Marshall talking about, from his vantage point in Moscow, what he saw as the drivers of Soviet foreign policy. What makes the Soviets tick? What do they want? What do they care about? What are they likely to do? And what can we hold at risk in response? Right? And th there is really no overstating the importance of the long telegram. Uh, the following year, in 1947, it was published in Foreign Affairs uh, under the pseudonym Mr. X, because uh, Kennan was still a government employee, but it was published under the title of The Sources of Soviet Conduct. That was the official title of the article. And every single graduate student uh, of uh, sort of uh, below a certain age and above a certain age has read this as part of their core curriculum, because it really was the Rosetta Stone for understanding Soviet intentions. Um, it was also the sort of, because knowledge is power, is also the formulative, uh, formative uh, intellectual document that allowed the creation of national strategies, like NSC 68, uh, because you need to understand your enemy to know how to fight them most effectively. Um, the reason I, I bring up Kennan and I bring up the long telegram is because there is currently no contemporary analog. We talk a lot about Russia. We talk very little about what Russia wants and what are the things that are propelling it to behave in certain ways. So I, I'm not here to give you a lecture on the sources of Russian conduct, but sort of in the short time that we have, I wanted to talk about a few things that sort of from my vantage point, from our institutional vantage point, we think are having a, a fairly profound impact on shaping Russian behaviors. But Russian behavior broadly uh, sort of throughout the world, but also specifically towards the Middle East and, and sort of how it's propelling Moscow's engagement. So the first driver I would talk about would be this sort of this pervasive sense of imperial nostalgia. Back in 2007, Vladimir Putin, speaking at the Munich Security Conference, uh, described the demise of the USSR as the, quote, greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Now, we may differ as to what the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century is. My parents lived in the Soviet Union. They would not term the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. But from Putin's vantage point, it was that. It was the loss of status, the loss of territory, the loss of influence that accompanied the Soviet collapse. And so it's not surprising that since then, his government, uh, under his control, has made the reconstitution of a neo-Soviet sphere a top priority, uh, politically, in terms of foreign policy, in terms of national security. What does this look like? Well, politically, it looks like uh, arrangements such as the Russia-Belarus Union, which the Russians hammered out in the late uh, 1990s uh, to create a, a sort of a condominium approach towards the country of Belarus, which used to be a republic of the USSR. It looks like the, the very broadly described policy on protecting compatriots, right? The sort of Slavs or uh, ethnic Russian speakers that exist both on the territory of the former Soviet Union and even beyond, even in the, in the United States, uh, that the Russians have claimed some sort of strategic interest in. In economic terms, uh, this looks like the creation of uh, this construct that Putin has championed uh, with limited success, to be fair, uh, called the Eurasian Economic Union, in which he's tried to bind the countries of the post-Soviet space into an economic construct that's different from the European Union, right? Because you have to belong somewhere, but it's very hard to belong to multiple things at once. So he would much rather tether these countries <coughs> to Moscow than to Brussels. Uh, in security terms, this looks like the creation of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or several other security blocks that all share the common uh, feature of having Moscow, or jointly Moscow and Beijing, as being the driving forces uh, behind, uh, behind what they do. Um, the result is 
what uh, a friend of mine, um, uh, sort of sitting in Moscow with me a few years ago, described, I think, uh, in the best way that I've ever heard, which is that this is a postmodern empire. It's an empire of dependency, not of actual territorial control. Unlike, unless you're in Ukraine, the Russian tanks aren't necessarily coming over the transom. In Ukraine, they are. Uh, and in other places, people fear that they will be soon. But in many other places, the Russian influence is felt uh, in economics, in politics, in culture, rather than in actual territorial control. Uh, but it's a political connection, it's a strategic connection, and, and it's vital nonetheless. And the reason this is so pervasive and the reason this is so popular is that because it's not a Putin project. Uh, there is this concept, uh, for those of you that speak Russian, of dirzhavnost, the idea of Russia as a great power. It's really it's hard to, tr it's not a direct analog into English, but it's a pervasive sense of Russia and Russia's destiny as a, as a great state. And um, that's why there is support for imperial expansion across the Russian political spectrum, right? All from the Russian left, the progressive Russian left, folks like Anatoly Chubais, right? The architect of Russia's shock therapy reform, economic reforms in the 1990s, all the way to Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, the, uh, the great thinker and laureate who gave a speech on the floor of uh, the Russian Duma, the lower house of the parliament in the mid 1990s, uh, which Herman's written about uh, extensively, about talking about the need for a greater, sort of reconstituting a greater Slavic state, right? So put bluntly, the reason Putin is successful at what he does is that because the people support him, right? He's sort of, he's hewing that path in a fairly broad and settled continuum of Russian strategic aspirations that both the left and the right can, can sort of uh, aspire to. Um, the second driver of Russian policy, both generally and in the Middle East, is ideology. Um, I, uh, just as a sort of as a 10 second tangent, I'm a firm believer in the fact that many societies have canaries in the coal mine, right? Individuals who are larger than life, and if you follow their careers, you get a sense of the larger trajectory of, um, uh, of the country itself. Uh, there is someone like that in Russia. There's many people like that in Russia, but, but uh, there is a, a political thinker, an ideologue, a philosopher, although that's a little bit of a charitable term, named Alexander Dugin, who is the most important ideologue of empire that you've never heard of. Alexander Dugin used to be a KGB archivist. He rose to power, became a consultant for uh, the Kremlin, uh, for all the force ministries. Uh, when Russia, and this sort of was, was the case uh, about 12 years ago, and then he receded from you. He went into academia. Uh, as Russia normalized its position, as Russia's economy slowed down, as Russia became a little bit more pragmatic, Alexander Dugin is now back in his role as a consultant for Russian officials, for, um, uh, for uh, I, I don't know for a fact that he's a consultant for Putin, but certainly for, for that circle of Russian leadership, uh, the things that he says, the things that he writes, and he writes a lot, let me tell you, as, as someone who has had the misfortune of having to read a lot of his stuff, he writes a lot. Um, and, and, and not altogether lucidly, by the way, but, uh, but the, the ideas that he encapsulates, that he captures, is all about that. It's all about Russia's destiny as a great power, as a great nation, um, and Russia's destiny to be in conflict with the West. Um, so in his 927-page magnum opus, which he published in 1997, uh, called Asnobe Geopolitiki, The Foundations of Geopolitics, he talks about the fact that Russia cannot exist, cannot exist outside of its essence as an empire because of its geography, because of its historical disposition, because of its relations with its neighbors, and also because of its essence, because of its strategic culture as an empire, Russia is destined to be in conflict with the West, namely with the United States. This is a pretty powerful message, and it's a message that resonates among people who chafe at the idea that Russia has receded as a global power, and Russia is, has been forced to assume a diminished status. Um, it's also one that is fed enormously by opportunism. Um, over the last eight years, you've seen a fairly systematic retraction of American influence in the Middle East under President Obama. Um, Russia 
has consistent with the old Russian phrase that Svitoye Mesa pusto ne right? Uh, a sacred space does not remain empty for long. Russia has rushed to fill that vacuum. And what that looks like is arms sales to the Egyptian government. Uh, it looks like military basing in Syria and a myriad other things that the Russians have done, not so much because it's part of a grand construct of Russian strategy, but because they want to be there because we're not. Uh, and that's, I think, part a, a pretty large part of the equation, because they think that they're destined to be there. Um, the third driver is, uh, I think, uh, very sort of natural to all of us here, right? We're in Washington. Um, when he was House Speaker, Tip O'Neill famously said that all politics are local. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's absolutely true. And I think it's true not only for us, it's true for Russia as well. And so what you see is this sort of this uh, dyad of internal drivers that are really propelling Russia into the Middle East in a pretty significant way. The first is economics. Um, the Russian economy uh, has sort of over the last couple of years has weathered the one-two punch of Western sanctions imposed as a result of Ukraine and low oil prices, which have really sort of wreaked havoc on their economy. Uh, institutions like the World Bank and the IMF have now given them a, I wouldn't say a clean bill of health, but a cleaner bill of health. They've said they're slowly turning a corner. But if you talk to any Russians, any Russians that, uh, Russian officials, Russians who understand uh, the way the government works, they, under, they will tell you that there are serious systemic problems, uh, structural problems in the Russian economy that are going to prevent real prosperity. Um, the consequences of this is that as Russia seeks to widen the pie, the economic pie, it naturally looks elsewhere. It doesn't look at sort of grassroots domestic prosperity. It looks at the rapacious acquisition of resources from abroad. It looks at defense contracts that are hammered out with international rogues like Iran. It looks at um, uh, sort of uh, all sorts of arrangements that reinforce that imperial impulse that the Russians have anyway. Um, Herman and I had the uh, sort of the uh, dubious privilege, I think, of being uh, in a fairly senior meeting in Moscow a few years ago. And I, I, you know, being young and stupid, I had the temerity to tell a senior Russian official that, um, you know, I, I think you guys are making a mistake in the Middle East because, <laughs> because you, you have, you know, you have a pretty sizable uh, Muslim minority and 98% of them are Sunni. And you are pursuing an accidentally Shiite policy in the Middle East. You're supporting Iran. You're supporting uh, the Alawites in Syria, who are almost Shiites in the Shiite conception, right? This is this is not going to end well for you. And I sort of got the nice sort of pat on the back, you know, silly boy. We are, to quote the official, controlling through investments, right? And that has been the traditional Russian way to think about it. Pragmatically, at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that Russian money can do, and that's sort of how they've thought about it. And th this, I, I think, goes to uh, at least part of the way towards shaping why the Russians are so panicked about the rise of Islamism, about sort of what they see as fundamentally irrational actors uh, that they can't control through investments, that it's harder for them to sort of to shape their behavior. Um, but the second trend, uh, sort of in in the sort of in this basket of internal factors, is demographics. And demography is a historically, chronically underserved topic uh, in grad schools. Right? It's much sexier to talk about the nuclear triad than it is to talk about fertility rates and things like that. Um, but demography is destiny. Right? You can't escape your geography, where your country is. And it's very hard to escape the cycle, the pace of your population, to change the pace of your population. And so Russia is undergoing this very profound, far-reaching population transformation. Um, Russia doesn't have the worst fertility rate in the world, right? So, so for those of you that don't know, understand demographics, the magic number for all demographers is 2.1. A woman during her fertile lifespan is supposed to have 2.1 children. One to replace herself, one to replace her husband who can't have any children, and 0.1 for, on average, for accidents, earthquakes, and what have you. And there are countries in the world that are, in particular in the Muslim world, that are doing much better than 2.1, and there are countries that are doing much worse. Uh, Russia is not the worst. Uh, Russia is about on a par with Europe at about 1.7. Uh, the country that holds the dubious distinction of being the worst in the world is Japan, uh, which is at 1.39, which is a long way of saying that the Japanese are rapidly going out of business, rapidly going out of business. Um, 
But Russia is sort of uh, on a negative decline in terms of its population. And remember, when, sort of, when we think about Russia, this is an enormous landmass. This is a country that spans nine separate time zones. And it has a population less than half the size of the United States, right? Uh, which is why you get uh, sort of provinces uh, and regions and oblasts in the Far East where the population density is less than that of Wyoming. It's less than six Russians per square kilometer. Um, and right, so the question really becomes a strategic one. How do you hold that territory if there's no people? Right? And the answer is with a lot of difficulty. Um, but Russia's demography, demography may be bad. And there's all sorts of uh, reasons for this, right? Uh, Russians, uh, Russians continue to have this pervasive culture of abortion. Uh, Russia hasn't really invested the sort of the post-Cold War peace dividend on things like health care and the social safety net, which is why sort of empirically uh, the life expectancy of a Russian male today is only slightly higher than that of a male from North Korea. Wow. Yeah. So, so, the, so what, what we effectively have is, is a country with third world demographic trends, but first world great power aspirations. <laughs> Right? And this has a profound impact for the health of the population as a whole. Um, but the population isn't declining uniformly. In fact, there are segments of the Russian population that are doing comparatively much better. Russia's Muslims are doing comparatively much better. Why? Because they drink less, and they divorce less, and they, on average, have more children. Right? There's all sorts of factors that feed into this. But the aggregate result is that Russia's Muslims, who were 16 uh, roughly 16% of uh, the overall national population just a few years ago are on track to be 20% in the next few years. And then sort of beyond that, right, it's all speculative, but there are trend lines that say that, you know, by the middle of the century, every other Russian may be Muslim. I think that's a little bit severe, but there are projections like that out there. But they do get you into the mode of thinking about you know, this wholesale transformation of the Russian state. It's becoming something different than what we've historically expected it to be. But all this would be fine, right? All countries change. America's changing, right? We're, we're relying more and more on immigration from Latin America, and we may all have our uh, sort of opinions about that, but like, it can be a healthy thing, right, if you have a, a good integrationist policy. But the Russians don't. And so what you've seen is, even as Russia's Muslims become a larger and larger cohort in the national polity, they are increasingly systematically shut out of national politics because Vladimir Putin has built this sort of hierarchical, rigid, ultra-nationalist identity that doesn't really have a lot of room for Russia's Muslims. But you have to belong somewhere, which is why even as Russia's Muslim underclass has grown, they've also radicalized because they've looked for different modes of identification, including, most conspicuously, first Al-Qaeda and other Islamist movements, and now the Islamic State for the moment. Um, so uh, the, the, this, I think, sort of these three things, right, the, the imperial nostalgia and the, the sort of strategic culture and the demographics and the economics sets you up for thinking about sort of how Russia sees the Middle East, right? Because I, I think it's fair to say that Russia, the Middle East is not a core area of strategic importance for the Russians. They want to be there, but it's not indispensable for them to be there, right? If you talk to Russians, they will tell you that the territory of the former Soviet Union and slightly beyond uh, are the areas that they consider their geopolitical backyard. The Middle East is a little bit further afield. But all of these drivers are propelling Russia further and further into the Middle East in a way that has profound implications for sort of for American policy and for whether or not we can cooperate with the Russians. So I'll just give you two examples. The first is Syria, right, where, where the Russians... Uh, since uh, September of uh, 2015, have entrenched themselves and they don't look like they're going anywhere. And there's a lot of things that have been written about it, but there's actually very little that's been written about why the Russians are there. I would make the case that, that the Russians are there essentially for four reasons. Uh, first of all, they're there to secure a strategic foothold, right? Because if Russia conceives of itself as a great power, the synchronon of being a great power is that you have to be able to project power globally. Syria was and remains Russia's principal outpost in the Eastern Mediterranean, pursuant to a military agreement made between the Soviet Union and Hafez al-Assad, Assad the father, back in the early 1970s. Uh, Russia's Mediterranean flotilla has been based out of the port city of Tartus since the mid-1970s. 
And when Syria started to go, as our British friends would say, pear-shaped, the Russians got really nervous about the idea that they would lose their foothold, their existing military foothold in Tartus. And that sort of shaped some, at least some of their calculation about the necessity to go in. Since then, if you'll notice, what the Russians have done is not a national plan for reconquest of Syria. It is a plan almost exclusively for the solidification of a long-term military presence, which is why the Russian naval base uh, on sort of on the western seaboard of Syria has been uh, sort of uh, doubled up with a Russian air base in Latakia, uh, just <coughs> north of the Alawite enclave, and they're doing no-fly zones uh, in an area that is roughly analogous, not to the entirety of the country, but to the area needed to protect the people that will let them remain in Syria over the long term and maintain their military presence. Right? They're essentially providing air cover for the Assad regime. Um, but as a result of their Syrian engagement, they've managed to construct an open-ended naval presence. Right? They've uh, deployed uh, their aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, to the Eastern Mediterranean. They're, they're doing sort of long-range rotations. Um, their position, if you're a Russian military analyst, is qualitatively better now, militarily, than it was uh, before. And that's all they were going for, right? The second reason is political. Remember, historically, uh, in terms of when the Russians made the strategic decision to go into Syria, their situation in Ukraine, which they thought was going to be a slam dunk, was not going so well. Right? I mean, you can make sort of arguments about sort of how their, situ how their position is going now. I think it's, it's far more modest in terms of gains than they expected initially. But there was, at that time, in September of 2015, there was an imperative to change the political conversation. Because Putin had sold the Russian population this bill of goods, that we are going out, we're going to reconquer sort of historic lands that are historically ours, we're going to sort of you know, put points on the board. And if you get bogged down in Ukraine, uh, your gains start looking meager indeed, and you need to change the political conversation. Um, the third trend, and this I think is the most profound one, is that the best defense is a good offense. Uh, so his f fantastic speech, and, and, and if you have the time to look it up, uh, Vladimir Putin gave this speech um, in April uh, of this year, in which he talked publicly for the first time about what his government thinks the size of the Slavic and Central Asian contingent in the Islamic State is, right? So we all know, up until then, we all knew that there was a pretty healthy representation of Central Asians and Russians in ISIS, in Iraq and Syria. But Putin's comments were something of a revelation because what he said was that of the roughly 30,000 uh, foreign fighters that have come from abroad to join the Islamic State um, in Iraq and Syria, 9,000 of them were either from Russia or from the FSU, right? So a third of the foreign fighter problem in the Islamic State is Russian, right? So if you're a Russian strategist, you would much rather go there and kill them there than wait for them to come home. And so that's why you see Russian uh, security services, force ministries essentially facilitating the exodus of jihadis out of Russia. I mean, they're clamping down, they're sort of you know, abusing them, but they're also helping them leave because the idea is we want them to get as far away from Russia's national borders as possible, and then we want to go and fight them there. Um, so what does this tell you? So first of all, it tells you that from the Russian conception, Syria is not only an aggressive imperial policy, it's also a defensive policy. They'd much rather be in Syria than wait for these guys to come home. The second is that Syria is an, for the Russians, Syria is an open-ended conflict. The Russians can't leave because if they leave, those guys are going to return, right? So, so what they're essentially doing is they're building a firewall. And the third is that in this broad construct, the Russians really don't care so much about personalities. They care about policies. They don't care so much about Assad. They care about uh, having a government in place that will secure their equities, whether it's their military basing or allowing them freedom of action that allows them to carry out their counterterrorism operations in a way that secures their homeland. So, um, so you know, in other words, in sort of the long way of saying that compromise may be possible politically in Syria, 
depending on these things, depending on what the White House, sort of what levers the White House wants to bring to bear. The less savory news, I think, is Iran. Um, the, over the last half year, you've seen a pretty healthy uh, attempt by, or uh, sort of thought process by the new administration about the idea of flipping Russia on Iran, right? It had a lot to do with Syria. It had a lot to do with how many things can we give the Russians so that they'll help us contain Iran, squeeze Iran, sanction Iran anew. And underlying all of these, all of the speculation was this idea that the Russian-Iranian strategic relationship was impermanent, that it was fragile, that you know, the Russians could be bought off. I would actually make the case that that's extremely unlikely. And it's more unlikely now than it was before for three reasons. First of all, Iran see, uh, Russia sees Iran as a force multiplier. If you go back and look at the writing, you go back and look at the writings of Alexander Dugan, who I mentioned, right, in his, in his, in his magnum opus, Asnovikia uh, Politiki, which, by the way, I swear to you, is all one sentence. 920. <laughs> that's what it felt like, anyway. But in that long, meandering sentence was a lot of conversation about how Russia, as it reclaims its place as a great power, right, this is not an automatic process, there are interim steps in which Russia needs alliances with countries like Germany, with countries like Iran, in order to have this sort of condominium that allows them to expand power in those regions, right? The, the concept of a Russian-Iranian strategic partnership is not alien to the Russian leadership. They may have no love lost for Iran's ayatollahs, but they see them as a very useful tool. And the more powerful that Eurasianist vision is, the more permanent the relationship becomes. The second reason is that Iran is a source of revenue for, for Moscow, right? So there was a time when Iran was under international and US sanctions in which Iran was clearly the junior partner in that strategic partnership. Uh, Iran was squeezed out of global markets. Iran was in, a in no position to dictate terms. But over the last two years, a whole bunch of things have changed, right? Iran has received uh, enormous economic windfall as a result of the uh, 2015 JCPOA, right? Equivalent to, I was telling, uh, telling somebody earlier, uh, equivalent to the Marshall Plan, right? I, I sort of made this comment in congressional, te I, no, no, I, you laugh, but I made this comment in congressional testimony a, a couple of summers ago uh, after the deal was signed and the, the opposition witness uh, yelled at me and said, oh, you don't know what you're talking about historically. So I did this really strange thing and I actually looked it up. And the Marshall Plan, the European Recovery Program, was launched in 1948, extended over four years, and it allocated what would, today would be $130 billion to 17 separate countries in Europe, right? So what you're actually talking about is that JCPOA is not a Marshall Plan for Iran. It is many Marshall Plans for Iran because the scope of the windfall is so massive that it has transformative effects on the Russian economy. I mean, on the Iranian economy, and also on the Russian economy, by the way, right? That's, that's where I was going. Um, because as Iran has stabilized economically, you now have the shoe on the other foot. A Russia that's sort of meandering uh, in fiscal terms is in greater need of economic partners that are solvent, that are strong, and that want to buy Russian wares. So when you see news about dozens of billions of dollars of new arms contracts that the Iranians sign with the Russians, this is the reason. The reason is that the Iranians have the money and the Russians really want their business. But it also means that Iran, increasingly for the Russians, is an economic lifeline. They are not a dispensable partner that they can just get rid of, right? The cost of doing that for them would be prodigious. So that sort of adds to the permanence of the relationship as well. And the third is that Iran is their guarantor of a long-term presence in Syria. So for those of you that follow Iran, you know that the Iranian leadership talks with alarming regularity about how the security of Syria is exactly the same as the security of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Right? They really don't differentiate. They have deployed massive uh, asymmetric assets uh, in the form of the Revolutionary Guards and Hezbollah into Syria to secure the Assad regime. There is no sense of, no sense of flagging resolve on the part of the Iranians. On the part of the Russians, I mean, I think the sort of the conventional wisdom is that they're going to be there for a long time, but I, I don't know that I, I would bet that they would be there indefinitely. 
because Vladimir Putin is getting a lot of grief. He's getting a lot of grief for Ukraine. He's getting a lot of grief for Syria in terms of monies expended, in terms of casualties that have been created as a result. <clears throat> so it's not inconceivable that he'll begin to rethink it, which means what? It means that ultimately the Russians are going to need to sue the Iranians for long-term access in Syria, right? The Russians will remain in Syria at the sufferance of whatever political constellation comes to power through the auspices of the Iranians, right? So if the Russians want to stay in Syria, and I would contend that they do, <clears throat> they probably don't want to tick off the Iranians all too much. And therefore, it becomes really, I think, speculative to think about the idea that we could buy them off uh, based upon the very thing that we can't guarantee, but the Iranians can. Um, and so what this all takes us to sort of the large debate that's sort of swirling around Washington, which is, is it possible to cooperate with the Russians? Um, and I would make the case that I think it's entirely reasonable to talk about areas of tactical cooperation where Moscow and Washington can really sort of talk and work in a constructive way. Everything from space launch to uh, resupply in Afghanistan to uh, cybersecurity, although the latest round of tweets have sort of you know, muddied that a little bit. But there are maybe half a dozen or so area, concrete areas tactically where you could actually sort of sit down with the Russians, you could hammer out sort of a, a pretty livable modus vivendi. Um, but that's tactically. Uh, and here, I would say, even on a tactical level, the question really isn't whether the Russians are going to cooperate on counterterrorism, for example. Of course they are. The Russians are definitely afraid of ISIS. They're going to bomb ISIS even if we're not there. The barometer, I think, for success on a tactical level is, are the Russians willing to do things above and beyond what they would do if we weren't there? Right? That's how you judge if they're a uh, sort of constructive tactical ally. Right? Everything beyond that is, well, frankly, I think it misses the boat. But on a larger strategic level, Moscow and Washington have deeply divergent interests in the Middle East. Right? They envision very different end states. And Russia sees itself historically and as a result of the fact that while we've had a fairly significant generational changeover in our officials, they have had a much less profound one. Right? The prevailing view in Moscow is that Russia is still the historical balancer of the United States in various regions, including in the Middle East. And so it's not a surprise that Russia is structuring its posture in the Middle East to take advantage of places where we are not active, and also to oppose us in places where we are. Right? And so the bottom line here is that the president has asked in various ways, sometimes in 140 characters, sometimes in more, uh, whether it's possible to have a more pacific relationship with the Russians. And I think it's clear that he would like one. The reality, though, is that it takes two to tango. And I don't think the evidence is present that the Russian leadership, beyond the tactical areas where we can cooperate, really has undergone this strategic sea change where all of the drivers that animate their push into the Middle East have sort of fallen away and we can come up with a arrangement in the Middle East that isn't zero sum. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Please use the microphones and speak directly into the... <coughs> Thank you uh, very much for your presentation this evening, sir. Uh, I think of Putin in my old-fashioned way as being a KGB colonel who is retired, semi. And I am amazed at his current speeches, which seem to portray that he is proposing to increase the faith role within his culture and other cultures. And I think back to Reagan's joke about the, the beet crop, where the man explains that the beets will reach up to God. And Thomas here said, you know, there is no God in Russia. And he said, there are no beets either. <laughs> <laughs> but I think of that, you know, atheistic approach that was present during Khrushchev's time and so forth. And that's kind of like what I thought was Putin's heritage. Would you comment on that? Sure, sure. And, and this is really interesting because I think there, there is, going back to Soviet times, there's a very organic relationship that has existed between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Russian government, before that, the Soviet government, 
in which the, the church is a distinctly political enterprise and it's one that's been progressively co-opted under Putin. But going back to the point that I made about sort of the, the, empty, uh, the sacred space never being empty, you guys remember two and a half years ago when uh, Vladimir Putin wrote that op-ed in the New York Times essentially styling himself as a defender of Western civilization, right? So there's a Russian word for this. It's, uh, in Yiddish, it's chutzpah. In Russian, it's naglist, right? But that's precisely what it was. It was him trying to capture a narrative that the United States was not currently occupying. I think that there, he does have sort of legitimate, sort of religious leanings within his own sphere of reference, sort of frame of reference, right, as a, as a sort of retired or not so retired intelligence official. But I do think that he thinks that this narrative, especially now, has enormous resonance, has enormous resonance when the U.S. appears to be disengaged from the Middle East writ large, the U.S. appears to be disengaged from the plight of Christians in the Middle East. There, there are gains to be made by saying this. Whether or not he's authentic, he's honest about it, that's a different story. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you a question, getting down into the weeds on Russia, Islam okay. issues, sure. and visit the role of uh, Ramzan Kadyrov and Chechnya in the whole interaction between Putin and his Muslim, large Muslim minority and what's going on in Syria and the dynamics of all right. of that between he and Kadyrov. Right. So that, that's... Uh... I'm, I'm glad you asked me an easy question. <laughs> um, that, that's, a, that's actually a really sort of evolved, con lengthy conversation, but sort of in the 30 seconds that I have, the, so Kadyrov is the Kremlin-appointed strongman, Muslim strongman, who is in charge of Chechnya, right, the historically restive republic. Kadyrov is there, and he's still there, because he has proven himself to be a loyal so soldier. He is one that, despite his excesses, and there are many, uh, the Kremlin can count on more or less to carry out its policies. And the condominium that the Russian government has built with Russian non-Muslim citizens over the last 20 years has essentially been, we, you're going to trade away some of your rights and some of your human rights in exchange for us keeping the terrorist problem at bay. Uh, and as a result, and this has worked reasonably well, so far, but it's increasingly a challenge as Russia's Muslim underclass grows, that is, it expands. And given the fact that Russia is the world's second largest importer of migrant labor, most of it from Central Asia, and most of those people are Muslim, Russia is increasingly feeling the pressure. And in, in, the, in, sort of in that frame of reference, Russia needs loyalists of that type. And Kadyrov is a very good loyalist. He's enormously brutal. He's, uh, you know, the, the latest scandal coming out of Chechnya is that they've created internment camps for homosexuals, uh, and to which Kadyrov has responded, that's impossible because there are no homosexuals in Chechnya, right? <laughs> which, it, which sort of gives you a little sense of sort of how he thinks, how he thinks he's sort of to move around in the Russian political sphere, but also what he thinks he's allowed to do as a result of this relationship. But... Not all Chechens share Kadyrov's views, which is why you have this really interesting sort of dynamic where there's a lot of Chechens disaffected with sort of Kremlin-managed rule that have left Chechnya, have left the North Caucasus, have migrated to Syria and Iraq, and are a fairly healthy part of the Russian part of the jihadist contingent there. And these guys are... I mean, if you sort of listen to what they say, listen to what, you know, sort of, uh, what they write, they're planning to come home. Right, and that tees up a pretty significant internal struggle, both within Chechnya itself, locally, and also on a national level about sort of the disposition of Chechens writ large. Lunch or dinner meeting, and his answer was very suspicious. 
So I told him, this is both Muslim, we are both Pakis. And I know, you know, it's part of our, it's in our blood to lie. But you are on American ground, so speak like American. Just say yes or say sorry. I mean, so these, if, if, if these come, this conflict based on culture and religious basis, there is no end. Because a lot of people see in those days when Islam was designed, there was no schizophrenia. But a lot of people now, now we have science gone so far but advanced, and we know some of those prophets, we claim to be prophets, they were, you know, they had these issues. So they created a lot of things. And if the, if that both religion are based on lying and deception, then you really cannot fight with them. Because most people believe that they have faith. Faith means you are willing to give your life for your faith, for whatever you believe. So how can you, so I mean briefly my question is, is that conflict with Islamic world or Islamic terrorism based on religious or cultural uh, foundation or is based on nationalism? Because if it's based on nationalism, then Russia is our enemy too. Thanks. Russia is what? Our enemy too. So, so I'm going to studiously avoid this question as much as I can uh, for a very simple reason, uh, because I think it actually starts a much broader conversation that absolutely needs to be had, but it's a little bit sort of off of what I'm talking about. What I would add where I think it's germane is how Russia sees itself vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim world and whether or not it sees that there's a conflict. So here's a little known, I always like to sort of, I come bearing gifts, I come bearing sort of little known facts. So. Um, the, you guys all know what the OIC is, right? It's the Organization of the Islamic Conference, uh, cooperation. It used to be known as the Organization of the Islamic Conference. Back in 2003, when it was still known as the Organization of the Islamic Conference, they had their annual meeting in Bali, Indonesia. Uh, and Vladimir Putin petitioned to go and address the OIC plenary session, uh, kind of like the General Assembly. And he delivered a speech in which he said that he understands that based upon prevailing demographic trends, Russia's future is Muslim, right? That's a, think about that, that was 14 years ago. That's a pretty profound statement. That doesn't mean that the Russians will go quietly. I think any Russian military man will tell you that it will be the last Slav standing that is carrying the nuclear football, right? Nonetheless, right, the pull of demographics is a pretty powerful thing. And so there's a real question here that sort of uh, that we need to think about when we think about the permanence of our partnership in counterterrorism with the Russians. When you have a country that is heading in this direction demographically, sooner or later there will reach a tipping point where it may not be possible to think about them in such certain terms about being an erstwhile ally in the war on terror. And I would make the argument that based upon what the Russians are experiencing now, they're far, they're likely in the near future to become not a producer of security in this realm, but a consumer of security. Because if you look at what's happening in uh, so Russia over the last six months, they've had you know, a series of sporadic terrorist incidents. Russian officials are very concerned that this is the start of something larger, right? Because every war must end and foreign jihadis, right, a third of whom are from the post-Soviet space, are going to try to make their way back. How successful they are in returning remains to be seen, but if they return in anything resembling the numbers that followed the Afghan Jihad, right, into the early 1990s, Russia's in for a world of hurt. You're not gonna see isolated incidents, you're gonna see a much more systemic uptick in violence, right? Russia's gonna turn inward, it's gonna become enormously repressive because it's sort of heading in that direction anyway, it's gonna become more so, but over the long term, we should be thinking about, not only about whether it's desirable or feasible to cooperate tactically with Russia in the war on terror. I think you can make a very credible case that we should cooperate against ISIS. But beyond that, what is Russia's trajectory? What does that actually mean for the permanence of the West and for the permanence of that partnership? So. I introduced but to make a comment on the question which was asked because uh, I would ask this question anyway. Uh, the problem is as far as I understand, there, is, there are two kinds of Islamic jihadists which Russia produces. 
So, so I, I think that's true historically. I think things are beginning to change a little bit. So I have to tell you, I have to answer the sort of the, the story with the story, right? So my boss, Herman Perchner, is a very soft-spoken gentleman. So sometimes I'm a little slow on the uptick and it takes me a little while to figure out what he wants. So I had been threatening to write a book about Russian demographics for years. And he wanted to sort of to get me to get off the stick and actually do it. So he comes to me one day and he says, Ivan, you and I are going to do a field study in Russia, in the middle of Russia, in December and January. And <laughs> at which point I realized that, that I'm going to do this once and only once, and then I'm going to write the book. And so that, but, but it was interesting because I remember as a result of that trip, we are... Um, it is enormously cold, and we're standing in the one of the central streets of the of Kazan, uh, uh, of sort of one of the sort of historic seat of uh, Russian uh, Tatar Islam, and and sort of, and you're looking at the Islamic University of Tatarstan, right? Which is so to back up a little bit. Uh, Muslims historically in the Russian Empire settled in two places. They settled in the North Caucasus and they settled in what's called the Volga region, right? Right around the Volga River to the east of Moscow. Um, so we're in Tatarstan, which is in the Volga region, and we're standing there. We're about to go into a meeting um, at the Islamic University of Tatarstan. And we sit there, we sit down with the rector, and he looks across the street and he says, those guys, and he points to this mosque, which had been built by the Turks a few years ago. He said, those guys are different. I said, what are you doing about it, right? I mean, he clearly meant that they're Salafi, right? Uh, what, are you, what are you doing about it? He's like, we have no answer, right? And that's a very interesting dynamic that's happening within Russia itself. Traditionally, the Russian state has successfully co-opted the Islamic narrative. They found uh, imams and muftis who are essentially okay with a fair amount of uh, autonomy as long as they don't challenge the legitimacy of the Russian state, right? They're not, they don't practice it as an insurgent religion. But increasingly, you see these external elements, whether they're Iranian or they're Turkish or they're Saudi, that are entering into the sort of uh, the Russian Islamic space in a way that the Russian authorities can't really combat. And a lot of that mobilization that takes place um, in the context of Russian Muslims stems from that. So a really interesting vignette, right? So Tatarstan is the seat of traditional moderate uh, uh, Islam in Russia. The black flags of ISIS appeared first not in the Caucasus. They appeared first in the Volga region. Why? Because this is the place where the ideology has sort of made greater inroads. Because there are differences. There are cultural differences, right? You have the sort of the legacy of the self-determination struggle. But nonetheless, this is a pretty fertile environment for alternative ideologies. Because, as I said, you have to belong somewhere. And if the Chechens increasingly believe that they don't belong in Chechnya, because Chechnya is complying to the Kremlin, and you don't belong in Tatarstan because uh, traditional Russian Islam is old and stale and kind of boring, you gotta belong somewhere. And that's, that, that uh, goes at least part of the way towards explaining why groups like the Islamic State and groups like Al-Qaeda are so appealing. Uh, you're, uh, you're inside, so we're very thought-provoking. Uh, unfortunately, one of the thoughts is starting to form in the back of my mind is that Based on what you've said, I, I'm starting to think that the Russians would do anything to frustrate a truce or a ceasefire that would last and bring about some sort of a uh, stagnant situation uh, because of the fear that with the lessening of hostility, some of those guys are going to come home. Is that a valid Observation. I, I think to, to a point it is. Um, I think it's conceivable to think of a political condominium that emerges, right? Assad must go, right, as we've said, but maybe his, the structure of his government remains and remains in a way that protects Russian equities and it alleviates some of the other elements. And then what you're going to see is them lobbying for expanded military overflight rights to make sure that you know, they can continue their aerial campaign, they can, they, they've secured the political ground, they want to make sure that these guys don't come back. And what I actually think is uh, a, a fairly significant sort of future point of Russian attention is going to be uh, securing the borders, uh, sort of you know, making the Russian Federation as impermeable as possible. 
it's impossible to make it totally impermeable because Russia relies a lot on migrant labor, right? So you have sort of this dynamic uh, in, the, in terms of economy that, that works against essentially just keeping these guys at arm's length. But nonetheless, within that milieu, you're gonna, I, I think you're gonna see a much uh, sterner approach to border security, to intelligence sharing, to you know, leaning on the countries of the Caucasus and Central Asia to make sure that these guys remain a buffer zone so that the, the foreign jihadists that Russia has exported are, don't become an import. Well, how do you think the President Trump's response to the Russian by the Russian authorities, in particular, his reference to not allowing Eastern European nations to be held hostage or energy supplies? I think it's a, it's a great question. Uh, the Poland speech was, I found, very refreshing. Uh, refreshing because it comes on the heels of all this speculation, right? A lot of heat, not a lot of light about what the president actually thinks about Russia. Look, I think it's clear up until now that we have an administration that would like to entertain the idea that it's possible to have a more pacific relationship with Russia. And I, I think he's made that very clear in his, his personal statements, the statements of his advisors. But personnel is policy. And so if you start looking at the people that he surrounded himself with, uh, General McMaster, who literally wrote the Army's playbook on confronting Russia in Eastern Europe, literally, like you can go get it on the internet. Um, Fiona Hill at the National Security Council, General Mattis at the Defense Department, what you're looking at, and um, uh, most recently the, the appointee for the sort of special envoy for Ukraine, what you get start getting is a sense that there's a corpus of people who are able and willing to play the bad cop to Trump's good cop uh, in the approach to Russia, right? So, so I think Trump wants to be good cop as much as he can, but he's perfectly willing to staff up with people that can really have a countervailing strategy. And I think that's good news. And I think it's good news uh, that he said all the right things about reassuring alliance solidarity, about sort of you know creating the necessary firewall to protect the integrity of Eastern Europe. Because I can tell you that in a lot of these places, uh, the grand sweep of history is not so long. And so they understand that their independence, which was very hard fought, is very fragile. And what they worry about in many places is a, the negative example of Ukraine. Not that Ukraine isn't going well for the Ukrainians. I think you know, the Ukrainian president, Petro Poroshenko, was here a couple of weeks ago. And by all accounts, right, from my Ukrainian friends, they, 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 the visit was on balance very positive. But what countries that aren't Ukraine are worried about is that if there is somehow a political settlement in Ukraine, that leaves Russia in a better position than it was in September of 2014, then the lesson that's learned by the Kremlin is that you should take a maximalist position in other parts of the former Soviet Union because then you can super peace and then you still end up with a, in a better place than you started, right? There's this old Russian saying, which I say and Herman says all the time, right? The appetite comes with the eating, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's very true when you think about Russia's approach to former holdings that it believes that it should still hold. So I, I, in that context, I found the speech uh, enormously refreshing and heartening. Whether it's matched by concrete action is a different story entirely, and I think that chapter hasn't been written yet. So. Uh, Dylan, uh, great insights, thank you. I wanted to ask you to come back to Palestine. Uh, past 24, 48 hours, uh, the number of moves by Administration to limit a new president of Palestine in the uh, level of, I wouldn't call it autonomy, uh, but uh, independence of his authority versus the previous president, uh, Shamim. Uh, you think it was just a uh, gradual, I want to say reintegration, but assigned just to the Palestinian authorities, or could it have a broad meaning, uh, possibly to pacify some of the people? Not um, so so I, I think it's it, it's an interesting question and Lee you're I think uh, much more versed in, in sort of in Tatar politics than I am I, I, I confess I haven't really kept current but I can tell you that when I was writing my book a few years ago and I was looking at sort of, you know, all these local publications, what struck me as sort of a really pronounced trend was that this reintegration, this harmonization drive, right, to lessen autonomy, to bring these local 
officials, local imams, sort of more into the fold, was prevalent even then. And I think, you know, the more the Russians are fearful of this external influx of, of uh, jihadis to sort of come back in, right, and resettle in places where they used to live, and also the natural impulse to create what Putin has called the power vertical, right, this sort of this horizontal, uh, this uh, vertical structure of power that leeches power away from the regions into the federal center, into Moscow. Uh, I think those things work hand in glove to suggest that, you know, if you're Putin and you're looking at Tatarstan where you've had some religiously based unrest, you want to keep these guys, you want to sort of uh, keep a tighter hold on these guys than you would otherwise, right? Autonomy be damned. Uh, Ilana, if I could, or, Ira, you had a question? I did, but you know. Take, you take precedence. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no let's pass it on. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about your overall conclusion, which I thought was brilliantly argued and well-founded. Uh, yes, we can only have pragmatic cooperation in specific areas. This has been true ever since 1991 in practice. But every time it has happened through a reset, which every president, but every new president of Russia also has undertaken, and it's been a very heavily ideological reset aimed at a broad change in relations without which most of that specific cooperation would not have occurred. And then it is, and it accomplished a lot. Can we achieve the pragmatic cooperation now and push a bit to the background some of our recent confrontation without this broader reset, even if it's likely to be due to fizzle. That's the immediate pragmatic question for you. Uh, the broader question is, isn't there a logic for this larger ideological reset that with communism gone, uh, with both of our societies being rooted in Christian heritage, I say that as an unbelieving Jew, uh, <laughs> but nevertheless the same civilizational origin mostly, uh, with sim facing similar threats from Islamic extremism uh, and many other things, and similar demographic challenges brought broadly, even much worse in Europe and Russia than over here, uh, similar interests vis-a-vis -vis the third world in the positive and the negative way. Isn't there a logic to this thought that we should be able to come to a reset that really does set and hold someday? Uh, whether or not it really works this year. Right, well, so I, I think that's a great question. And I think there is, as I said, there is a basis for suspecting that you can absolutely do that on a tactical level, mm -hmm. right? If you can uh, sort of take the romance out of it, identify things that you really uh, sort of, you can, areas where you can cooperate with the Russians. And also, by the way, as I said, set benchmarks in which you can actually see that the Russians are helping, right? They're not just bombing ISIS, they're doing sort of constructive things. But the larger sort of strategic reorientation, unfortunately, I think, has been based around, uh, one of the reasons why I started with sort of trying to explain a little bit about how the Russians see the Middle East and how the Russians see the world is because we really don't do that, right? Uh, we, if we're Republicans, we look into Vladimir Putin's soul. If we're Democrats, <laughs> if we're Democrats, we think the Russians are just like us and we should be able to do a deal, right? But the reality is they're animated by very different considerations doesn't mean they're bad, and it doesn't mean that they're necessarily diametrically opposed. But I think you run into tr tremendous problems if you don't acknowledge what makes them tick, and you simply assume that the same things that make you tick are the things that make them tick. Because frankly, that was the policy of the last eight years. And you know, we, we understand sort of, you know, back, we've moved backwards from the reset. Uh, and and yeah. I'll end with this, because I know Bob's gonna give me the hook in a second. Um, in March of 2009, uh, Hillary Clinton went to, I think it was Vienna, to do the reset with um, uh, Sergei Lavrov, right, the Russian foreign minister. Um, and as part of, so this was right when the, you know, the Staples Corporation had their easy button campaign, right, you guys remember? Right, the red button, easy, wow. and reset, yeah. So, so she thought it would be a swell idea to have a reset button. Um, and so she did it. And so she asked uh, whoever, you know, uh, 20 pound brain, uh, linguistic brain in the State Department Michael. to I was in the State Department at the time. Should you ask anybody in the State Department? So, so, who, so who, who did the... Michael. Huh? Oh, McFall, McFall. Well, okay, well, that, that's, a, that's a separate conversation, right? But, but uh, anyway, long story short, uh, she has a button that said, so it, there is no exact translation of reset in Russian. 
there is something called perizagruska, which is essentially a reloading, like a reloading of the operating system. And that would be fine, right? If, it, if the button had said perizagruska, it would be great. But the button said perigruska, which means overload. As in, we are completely outmatched by the Russians and we don't have a good idea of what to do, have a button, right? <laughs> and that, I think, is a very sort of apocryphal story as to how we completely misunderstood how our overtures were perceived in Moscow. So I hope I've given you guys just a little bit of a taste about how, how to think a little bit differently. So thank you. Wait, no, no, don't no? No? Ask the privilege of the last oh, question, please. which was in the context of what Ira just asked you, uh, what would they be willing to trade relief from the economic sanctions uh, for? And would it involve anything in the Middle East? How much does it hurt them? It seems to be the, the principle of not the only right. weapon the West deploys against right. Russia regarding actions in Ukraine or anywhere else that we don't like? Right. So I, I think that's a good question. I actually have a causality problem with that question, though, because we, we Americans tend to, I mean, we're sort of the big guy on the block, and we assume that when we do something, that is the causal reason for an effect to happen. Right? So we impose sanctions, and we assume that the Russian economy is floundering because of our sanctions. That's only partially true, I think. You, know, the, a much, you can make a, a, a fairly credible economic argument that a much more powerful centripetal force has been exerted by the low price of world oil, right? And the fact the Russian dependency on, uh, on oil and natural gas exports and things like that, right? It doesn't mean that our sanctions are irrelevant. Uh, by the way, also the Russians have done all sorts of stupid things, like they voluntarily imposed a ban, an internal ban on uh, foodstuffs from the European Union and things like that, right? Because like, you know, I'm gonna spite you by biting off my nose. And you know, I think it's a great idea. But nonetheless, right, I mean, th this is sort of a multi-causal sort of problem. And what I worry about sort of in that broad sweep is that the sanctions were imposed based upon a concrete response to a specific thing that the Russians did, right? Russian aggression in Ukraine, Russian annexation of Crimea, Russian ongoing destabilization in the Donbas. And if we disaggregate that, if we start offering them sanctions relief in exchange for their cooperation in the Middle East, the lesson might very well be that, well, you know, if we sort of wait this out long enough, the Americans like sort of lose focus and then we can do whatever we want in Ukraine, right? And that's probably not a constructive lesson. So, so. Thank, you. Thank you guys. Oh, by the way, by the way, I would be a terrible salesman if I didn't say that this was spelled out much better in my book, which you can buy over there. So thank you, guys.